Thoreau said this, he said, if you advance confidently in the direction of your own dreams and endeavor to live the life which you have imagined, you will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. What that means is that success is not something that you can get in life. Success is an inner process. Success is something that you bring to everything you do in your life. It isn't something you get out of what you do. And when you get that, and you learn how to get the junk out, and advance confidently, doing what makes the most amount of sense to you, based on your inner signals, and the one issue of morality, which is you never interfere with anybody else's right to do the same. Each person has their own right to advance confidently in the direction of their own dreams. And when you violate that, you're violating the principle of the universe, the essence of the universe, which is cooperation and harmony. Then success will begin to chase you. And it will come into your life and arrive in your life in amounts that you never dreamt of before. That you never dreamt of. Things will start happening to you that you would never imagine before. I'm working on a book right now that's going to be called You'll See It When You Believe It. And when you start believing in some of these principles, you'll start seeing things that you were blind to for so long. When you were back here in the two and the three and the four and the five, when you were moving away from yourself, as long as you're moving back towards your universal essence, your harmony with yourself, your cooperation with the rest, things will start happening in ways that you never dreamt of. Jung called it uh, synchronicity. And we, it's, it's a term that we use to, to explain how unexplainable coincidences sort of happen in our life and how come these things happen. I'm going to share a couple of those with you before we leave. The, the quality versus appearance in your life means that you get that inner candle flame working in a way that gives you quality, independent of what other people think of you. Maslow, in defining self-actualizing, no-limit people, said they are independent of the good opinion of other people. Of the good opinion of other people. Independent of it. They're so busy advancing confidently, doing the things that make sense, and bringing success to changing their baby's diaper, and bringing success to weeding their garden, <laughs> and bringing it to the job. They bring it on the airplane so that when they run into somebody who is, who is rude to them, a stewardess that is rude, they don't see it as an attack on them. It's just where they are and they send them love. Help them a little bit, you know? They're kind, to, when somebody wants to get in on the freeway and their uh, one old temptation when they were on the one to the six side, was to say, oh yeah, nobody's getting in front of me, I'm getting there first. It's like, they slow down a little bit. They don't have all that type A stuff of having to beat somebody else and having to defeat somebody. It is, it's a new way of being. It's a way of quality, where your harmony allows you to cooperate and you are a part of what this whole thing is about. New way of being, quality rather than appearances. Instead of looking all your life for achievements, and externals, try living your life on knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Knowledge instead of achievement. For the sake of knowledge, being in a, in a context in which you don't have to collect a lot of merit badges. You don't have to collect a lot of, a lot of uh, awards and other people's uh, value judgments that you go to school or you go out into the world or you read or whatever it is you do because it makes sense to you not because of what somebody else is going to put on a transcript or where you're going to appear in a class list we're in an achievement oriented society which tells us that we evaluate and judge a human being based upon how many achie achievements he has but most of the people who get caught up in that trap and are always in this circle of trying to get ahead, trying to always get ahead, their reward for that almost always is higher blood pressure, ulcers, early deaths, and even things like cancer we're beginning to find out are related to the kinds of stresses that we have. And remember, it's a perfect universe. There's no stress in it. There's only people thinking stressful thoughts. 
And when you put that pressure on yourself to always achieve and get ahead of the other guy, you miss what it's really all about. There's nothing wrong with goals. It's falling in love with them that's the problem. <laughs> it's not being able to be flexible and be alter them. If you have a goal to get here, to get $100,000 in the bank, to get to this promotion, to get two cars in your garage, to whatever it is that your goal is, and you're on your way to that, and you're always working at the goal, all of this stuff on your way to the goal is called striving. And that's what you learn, striving. And striving is a very low level place to be. When you get to your goal, because all you've ever known is striving, you will just always suffer from this disease called more. You will just upgrade your goal to $200,000, four cars and two houses and another wife and a younger one and, and all of these kinds of things. If you have a goal and you understand that every step along the way is a present moment to enjoy and to live, then the goal won't become any obsession. I don't have any goals in my life. People ask me, where are you going to be five years from now? What are you going to be doing? What's next for you? I just, uh, I remember what Lincoln said, who to me was like the greatest person who ever sat in that White House. He said, I've never had a policy. He said, I just tried to do what made the greatest amount of sense each and every day of my life as I sat there as the president of the United States. And I think there's, there's something really significant in that, that you don't have to get it all planned out and follow a certain pattern and do it a certain way. If you just sort of trust your inner instincts and go with that and live each moment, the goal stuff will all take care of itself. But if you're sacrificing and pushing your life aside and, and uh, suffering on your way to trying to get someplace, you'll never get there. It will always elude you because once you get there, you'll just have to upgrade it. And that's because that's all you'll know. Nowness is that purest form of sanity, living in this moment and enjoying it. And all the rest of it will sort of work its way out. Treat yourself as if you already are what you'd like to be. Whatever it is that you envision for yourself, no matter how lofty or impossible it may seem to you right now, I encourage you to begin acting as if what you would like to become is already your reality. This is a wonderful way to set into motion the forces that will collaborate with you to make your dreams come true. To activate the creative forces that lie dormant in your life, you must go to the unseen world, the world beyond your form. Here is where what doesn't exist for you in your world of form will be created. You might think of it this way. In form, you receive information. When you move to spirit, you receive inspiration. It is this world of inspiration that will guide you to access anything that you would like to have in your life. What it means to become inspired. Some of the most significant advice I've ever read was written more than 2,000 years ago by an ancient teacher named Patanjali. He instructed his devotees to become inspired. You may recall that the word inspire originates from the words in and spirit. Patanjali suggested that inspiration involves a mind that transcends all limitations, thoughts that break all their bonds, and a consciousness that expands in every direction. Here is how you can become inspired. Place your thoughts on what it is you'd like to become, an artist, a musician, a computer programmer, a dentist, whatever. In your thoughts, begin to picture yourself having the skills to do these things. No doubts, only a knowing. Then begin acting as if these things were already your reality. As an artist, your vision allows you to draw, to visit art galleries, to talk with famous artists, and to immerse yourself in the art world. In other words, you begin to act as an artist in all aspects of your life. In this way, you're getting out in front of yourself and taking charge of your own destiny at the same time that you're cultivating inspiration. The more you see yourself as what you'd like to become, the more inspired you are. The dormant forces that Patanjali described come alive, and you discover that you're a greater person than you ever dreamed yourself to be. Imagine that, dormant forces that were dead or non-existent, springing into being and collaborating with you as a result of your becoming inspired and acting as if what you want is already here. By having the courage to declare yourself as already being where you want to be, you will almost force yourself to act in a new, exciting, and spiritual fashion. You can also apply this principle to areas other than your chosen vocation. If you're living a life of scarcity and all of the nice things that many people have are not coming your way, perhaps it's time to change your thinking and act as if what you enjoy having is already here. This doesn't involve deception, arrogance, or hurting others. This is a silent agreement between you and God in which you discreetly work in harmony with the forces of the universe to make your dreams become a reality. This involves a knowing on your part that success and inner peace are your birthright, that you are a child of God, and as such, you're entitled to a life of joy, love, and happiness. 
In your relationships with your lovers, co-workers, and family, act as if what you would like to materialize in those relationships is already here. If you want a sense of harmony in the workplace, maintain a clear vision and expectation of this harmony. Then you're out in front of your day, seeing five o'clock arriving peacefully for everyone when it's still 7.30 in the morning. Each time you have an encounter with someone, your five o'clock vision pops into your head, and you act in a peaceful, harmonious way so as not to nullify what you know is coming. Furthermore, you act toward everyone else as if they, too, are all that they're capable of becoming. These kinds of expectations lead you to say, I'm sure you'll have everything ready this afternoon, rather than, you're always late with everything and I wish you'd get on the ball. When you treat others in this way, they also fulfill the destiny that you've reminded them is there for them. In your family, particularly with your children, it's important to always have this little thought in mind. Catch them doing things right. Remind them often of their inherent brilliance, their capacity for being responsible, their innate talents, and their fantastic abilities. Treat them as if they're already responsible, bright, attractive, and honorable. You are so terrific, I'm positive you'll feel great about your interview. You're so smart, I know you'll study well and do well on that exam. You're always connected to God, and God doesn't do sickness. You're going to feel much better tomorrow at this time. When you act towards your children, parents, siblings, and even more distant relatives, as if the relationship was great and was going to stay that way, and you point out their greatness rather than their goofiness, it is their greatness that you will see. In your relationships to your significant other, whomever that may be, be sure to apply this principle as frequently as you can. If things aren't going well, ask yourself, am I treating this relationship as it is or as I would like it to be? So how do you want it to be? Peaceful? Harmonious? Mutually satisfying? Respectful? Loving? Of course you do. As such, before your next encounter, see it in those ways. Have expectations that focus on the qualities of inner peace and success. You'll find yourself pointing out what you love about that person rather than what they're doing wrong. You'll also see the other person responding to you in love and harmony rather than in an embittered way. Your ability to get out in front of yourself and see the outcome before it transpires will cause you to act in ways that bring about these results. This strategy for living works for virtually everything. Before I speak to an audience, I always see them as loving, supportive, and having a terrific experience. Before writing, I see myself with no writer's block, being inspired and having spiritual guidance available to me at all times. As A Course in Miracles reminds me, if you knew who walked beside you at all times, you could never experience fear again. This is the essence of inspiration, as well as seeing the future in terms of how you want it to be, and then acting exactly in that manner. The natural extension of being grateful is the development of a generous heart. Perfect generosity is a willingness to give of yourself and all that you have manifested without any expectation of a return. Manifesting is about connecting to the universal spirit which is infinite and abundant in supply. Manifesting is not about seeing neediness in yourself, but is rather about feeling complete with that radiant abundance. It is concerned with unconditional love and attracting that abundant love to your individual life. When you feel the presence of that abundance, your feeling of gratitude will push you in the direction of generosity. It is in the expression of your generosity that you will feel most connected to the unconditional love of the universal spirit. The more you feel a desire to share what you receive unconditionally, the more you will experience it flowing into your life. Generosity and self-liberation go together. Generosity is helpful for your own liberation in that it teaches you about the inner quality of letting go. Letting go and releasing your attachments are the most freeing things you can do to liberate yourself from the ego. A need to hang on to things and money you receive arises out of an inner sense of incompleteness. Practicing generosity aligns you with your sense of completeness and love. Generosity extends to more than simply sharing your material possessions. Generosity includes offering kindness, care, love, and nurturing. Furthermore, the spirit of generosity can and does ultimately relate to how we treat ourselves. If you have a generous heart that has no qualms about giving, you will treat yourself lovingly and will nurture yourself without feeling any sense of guilt. Thus, giving and receiving are really the way the universe works. Every single time that you take in a breath and then exhale, you are engaged in a process of giving and receiving that is vital to the material and spiritual world. With each inhalation, you take in the oxygen and nitrogen you must have to exist. And with each exhalation, you send back the carbon dioxide that supplies the entire plant world. The cycle of generous giving and receiving is exactly the same as the very act of breathing. Look around you and notice how everything in our universe is a result of giving and receiving. 
The entire food chain represents a giving of life and a taking of life, and then a giving back in an endless cycle of material manifestation. The process works in the same way on the spiritual level. You put out loving energy to connect to that which you desire, and it returns to you. It is a giving and receiving action. So therefore, it's really important to cultivate an attitude of generosity. Put generosity into your manifestation practice to keep the natural flow of giving and receiving moving in your life. Recognize that this is a way of being that can be developed. You may have convinced yourself that giving is impossible because you have too little for yourself. If you're not generous when it's difficult, you will not be generous when it is easy. Generosity is a function of the heart, not the wallet. A generous heart is one that places no limitations on its ability to be generous with others and does not do it for reward or recognition. Think of the myriad of things that you do each day for others, including animals and the environment, as ways of practicing generosity. Talking to a lonely neighbor, feeding a stray cat, opening a door, anonymously paying the toll for the car behind you, vacuuming the carpet, or whatever may occur in the thousands of actions you undertake each day. Most important, remember that to give without expectation of an acknowledgement is truly the work of your higher self. Keep your generosity practices private. Then become aware of the internal resistances that arise within you when you have an impulse to give. Your fear of not having enough for yourself and your family, your doubts about whether others are truly needy, the fact that others won't appreciate it anyway, are impulses that you need to honor as valid. All of these inner doubts and fears should be examined without judgment. And then give yourself designated times and periods of time to practice being generous, particularly in offering service or in giving of your time. Sometimes I notice my young son out playing soccer by himself, wishing in his heart he had someone to play with. I remind myself to forget about the zillion things I have to do, my state of fatigue or whatever, and I designate the next several hours to simply sharing my time with him, something we both love. Practice being able to receive. Accept help when others offer it. Allow others to do for you without feeling embarrassed or without feeling that your independence is threatened. If you turn off the receiving side, you cut the natural flow of energy just as if you turned off the giving side. Receiving is very much a component of the spiritual practice of manifestation, and you can work at allowing this into your life with gratitude and love. Furthermore, practice giving just a bit more than you think you can, and a bit more than your own comfort level allows. Whatever you have convinced yourself is the limit of your generosity, try going beyond it. You also can practice a little bit more generosity with your own self than you are normally accustomed to. Order the item on the menu that costs more, or give yourself a few extra days on your vacation trip, or allow yourself the luxury of a body massage or a facial. Extend your generosity into service as a way of life. Our encounters and relationships are a central influence on ourselves and each other. Service is a word that is not commonly thought of as part of our ordinary relationships, yet service simply cannot be separated from relationships. When you cultivate an attitude of gratitude and generosity, you will find yourself wanting to be in the service of others. You will find it natural to extend that which you receive into the service of others as well. If you receive a great teaching, you will want to teach it to others. If you receive love, you will wish to extend that love unconditionally outward. Your relationships will automatically be felt as gifts for the service of others. When you contemplate the purpose of your life in the material plane, you will discover that the only thing you can do with your life is to give it away. You cannot lay claim to anything. It is all transitory. You will find your purpose and your strength when you see that you are in a relationship with all other living things and that you are purposeful and peaceful when you serve in some capacity. It is out of this state of recognizing our fundamental interconnectedness that we realize we are all in a constant state of service to each other. It is this awareness that you want to keep uppermost in your mind as you generate this principle of spiritual manifesting. Service, at its very basic core, is an inner choice to offer a helpful and healing attitude to others as well as to ourselves. A natural outgrowth of feeling grateful for our daily life manifestations is experiencing the inclination to be generous. What goes around truly does come around. The more you give away and do everything that you do in the service of others, the more that seems to come back. The cycle of real magic takes root. This lesson of prosperity applies to all fields of endeavor. When I was boarding an airplane early one time, I overheard this sarcastic voice of a flight attendant saying, Here come the animals. I knew it was only a matter of time until that organization perished from a scarcity of passengers. Sure enough, they've gone into bankruptcy. Employees need to know in their souls that they are privileged to serve those who are willing to give of their income to use the service. But I'm not talking to an organization, I'm talking to you. 
You can shift your consciousness all you want, but you must also shift the emphasis of what you do from results to purpose. Try it. Shift for a one-month period of time and see if miracles don't start showing up in your life. The less you need to force this new way of being on yourself, the easier it becomes to let it be the guiding principle of your life. It is about allowing your natural self to flow peacefully and knowing your bliss comes from giving and not getting. Letting yourself just flow is a concept you will want to become quite familiar with as you begin to allow the prosperity that you desire in your life. Earlier in this tape, I discussed how everything seems to work perfectly in our lives when we are inspired. Flow is that kind of an inspiration, one so powerful that all obstacles seem to be removed, and we are in love with what we are doing so much that it seems to just flow without any effort from us at all. Getting to flow in your life means achieving a state of concentration so total that everything else becomes non-existent. People who experience prosperity in their lives know how to achieve this magnificent state wherein their activities, instead of being a tedious set of chores to finish, become more like a meditation, only they are active and involved rather than sitting quietly. Getting to this zone, you are literally watching your body do things that are incredible. You are experiencing magnificent joy or bliss, and nothing can get in your way. You are on purpose, and you are having that peak experience that others can only dream about. There is a way to get to this state of flow. These are not only the secrets to becoming a super achiever in the workplace, they are the secrets for producing genuine miracles in your life. This process includes 1. Having an overriding spiritual goal that gives meaning to your work. Making your work a meditative experience, and instead of seeing yourself as doing a particular task, you actually in your mind become the task. You shift from a human doing to a human being, if you will. There is no separation. You and the task are unified all in the name of that overriding spiritual objective to give of yourself in a purposeful way. 2. Focus and close your mind to all distractions. You can train your mind to focus, and this is why I've been encouraging you to learn to meditate. Give your mind the same mental training that you give your body when you want your body to be in a maximum physical condition. You need not be a slave to your senses. Focusing is your natural knowing within. You can either ignore it or go there often. 3. Surrender to the process. You must resist your impulse to strive for what you want. Surrender to God, or your higher power, or however you choose to spell it. You must let go and surrender to the actual process. Forget about the result, and put your mind and your physical body totally into the experience at hand. This is not that difficult to achieve. Don't strain to achieve. Instead, enjoy the process of the work that you are doing. The results will come independent of your striving for them. 4. Experience the ecstasy. This is the automatic result that will flow to you from the above guidelines. You will know a kind of inner beatitude and bliss that will be unmistakable. It will sneak up on you and hit you over the head, so to speak, but nevertheless, you will know that glorious emotional peak experience if you get yourself to flow in your life. The ecstasy is its own miracle. 5. Watch as you see yourself reaching peak productivity without striving. Your state of ecstasy opens up new vistas of creativity and energy. This natural state of bliss is the key to improving your performance. This is the state that superachievers are able to create for themselves. The processes of surrendering, focusing, and living at purpose lead to ecstasy. When you feel that inner bliss, you simply want more and more of it. The more of it that you are able to create for yourself, the more productive you become. Your thoughts create all of this ecstasy, and ultimately all of the miracles that are going to come into your life in the form of increased prosperity. Your mind is very powerful in terms of what it can produce in your physical reality, as well as the physical reality beyond your own borders. You are now on a path of working toward reversing scarcity consciousness to one of prosperity. This is largely a mental game. You must convince yourself that you and only you are responsible for the pictures in your mind. You must know how very powerful your picturing process is in creating the material world that you experience. This is a universal principle. This is a vital, alive factor of the universe that you are a part of and that is also a part of you. What you can conceive of as a picture in your mind, you can create in the physical world, provided you do not let go of the picture. My wife Marcy and I are currently having our children take lessons from acknowledged masters in the art of meditating and learning to trust one's inner vision. We do this not to give them an advantage over others, but for the purpose of their knowing that they have something within them that no one can ever take away from them, regardless of the material circumstances of their lives. They are learning very early 
that their peace and tranquility as human beings is dependent upon themselves, and that they have a special retreat within that is always available to them. The greatest understanding you can have is that you don't understand. And spending your life and your energy and your relationships on trying to always be understood and have someone else agree with you and understand you is one sure way to make sure that you're going to be a victim for the duration of that relationship. You don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to uh, allow yourself to be in a position where someone else is demanding to be understood by you. There's some things that are very simple, some very simple little clues that I use in my own life and in, uh, in pulling your own strings that I'd like to share here with you. Um, under the heading of being quietly effective and knowing you're never going to be understood. First is that shrugging is a virtue. If you could just learn the art of the shrug, I like Ayn Rand's uh, title, uh, Atlas Shrugged, Atlas holding up the whole world and just shrugs. And the whole idea of uh, of not having to be in a position to, uh, to, to defend yourself or to be understood or somebody's demanding something from you and where you could just sort of shrug your shoulders and say, well, I don't understand. I just don't understand, and that's okay. My wife and I do this to each other all the time. I mean, she behaves, she does the, the craziest things in the world, and vice versa. I mean, she thinks what I do is crazy, too. I mean, she uh, believes in what she's doing and believes that that's the way a house has to be run, for example. Um, she makes the beds first thing in the morning. I mean, that to her is uh, it's just her way. I have lived under the philosophy that it's not any healthier psychologically to get into a made bed than it is to get into an unmade bed. But she makes the bed. I don't understand somebody getting out of bed in the morning and making the bed. But I don't have to understand. It's not necessary for me to understand. I don't have to get into a you're wrong and I'm right attitude toward it. It's just a simple shrug. If you want to make the bed, that's terrific. I'll even help you if you want to. Just let it go. You don't have to. I don't have to understand that. And you know something? Life is full of those little things. Everywhere you go, you're going to encounter people who do things their own way. And that's really what makes the world go around, that uniqueness, that specialness in people. So if you just shrug at it and stop telling yourself that I have to be right, and I have to make somebody else wrong in all of my interactions with them, just shrug. Just shrug. Quietly shrug your shoulders and say, they have a right. They're on their own path. They have a right to do what they want to do. And you don't have to be understood. And when you get into that, that, uh, that mindset of not needing to be understood all the time, then you're not going to be explaining yourself and having somebody else explain themselves to you over and over again endlessly. Being offended is a, is a choice of, to be a victim. Did you, you ever think how silly it is to go around being offended? There are people who turn on the radio and they hear somebody speaking in a certain tone or saying a word that they don't like, and they, they have a whole vocabulary of words that they're offended by. And if somebody says one of them, right away they go off into a dither. Well, it's just like letting somebody else's behavior decide how you're going to be emotionally. I mean, you can be the kind of person who goes down the street and your emotions are being pulled by everybody else, your strings are being yanked by everybody else in the street, depending on what, what words they choose, what symbols come out of their mouth. This person says hell, that one says damn, this one says uh-oh, this one says caca, that one says poo-poo, this one says wee-wee, whatever it may be, and you're offended, uh, or whatever synonyms you want to use for all of those functions. Uh, for what? what? What's It's like allowing yourself the right to process somebody else's behavior for what it is. It's their behavior. It's not yours. If you don't like what somebody is saying on the radio, tune the dial someplace else. If you don't like the way somebody else is dressing, turn your eyes someplace else. Don't feast your eyes on it. If someone else wants to hear rock music that you, uh, you think is uh, disgusting, then don't listen to it. That's what this whole thing is about. That's what the First Amendment to the Constitution is about. That's what free speech is about. That's what free expression of as a human being is about. That there's no code that is going to fit everyone. And, and choosing not to be offended is to choose not to be a victim. People speak the way they speak. I don't like some of the language that I see in the films. I don't let my children go and, and see some of the films. I don't like the violence that is on the screen. Rather than being offended by it and going, being all upset about it and getting myself worked up and being a victim to the people who choose to display violence on the screens, I simply don't go to those movies. I don't have anything to do with them. And, and I don't miss them. And I, and I, and I, I happen to believe that it's part of the gratuitous violence that we find throughout the culture. But I'm doing what I can to eliminate that. But being offended by it, being upset by it, it's as silly as being offended by starvation.
Starvation is a part of what the universe is about, and so is my desire to change it and to improve it. That's just as important, and that's what I go with. I go with what I'm for rather than what I'm against. Everything that you're against weakens you. Everything that you're for empowers you. So the question is, do you want to be empowered or do you want to be weakened? Everything you fight, you'll be weaker for the effort. Everything that you're for will empower you. When they asked Mother Teresa if she would uh, march against the war in Vietnam in 1967, she said, no, I won't. She said, but if you have a march for peace, I'll be there.